has run the race before us. He has won the victor's crown. And he calls to every Christian, follow me to higher ground. God gives we. a good song and it fits right in with my message tonight about uh, crumbling dreams, stumbling feet and uh, if you'll turn to Genesis chapter number 39 and verse number 20 we'll see the text. While you're turning there I want to remind you uh, this Wednesday night all of you who are working in uh, master clubs that there will be a workers meeting at 6 o'clock that's one hour before the regular service. We we'll have about a 30 minute meeting and so if you'd be here at 6 we would appreciate that. Uh, Bible Institute begins at August the 20th on Tuesday night, Friday, August 23rd, is children's activity, hot dogs, games, cartoons, and a fun time. Uh, Wednesday, August 28th, Master Club actually begins at 6.30 in the evening, and then missionary Alan Copeland will be with us on that same night, August 28th, and present his ministry to Puerto Rico. In Genesis, chapter number 39. preaching on the Ten Commandments on Sunday morning, and I really enjoyed it. I have. I, I, I think there are a lot of things that get dropped out nowadays that don't get preached on because we live in the uh, win friends and influence people era, <laughs> and some things don't get preached on because it's not considered to be uh, very good for winning friends and making people happy. And so, But although I, I have got a great deal of joy out of preaching out of the Ten Commandments. And I, I think I think you have, uh, most of you at least, have uh, profited from it. I've had people tell me they have, and so I, I'm excited about that. But tonight, I want to preach out of Genesis chapter 39, and beginning in verse number 20. Genesis chapter 39 and verse number 20. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison place where the king's prisoners were bound and he was there in the prison but the Lord was with Joseph would you notice that phrase I hope you'll underline that in your Bible but the Lord was with Joseph I wish, would you read that with me just one time let's read it together one more time but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison and whatsoever they did there. He was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not, unto, not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him. There it is again. Would you underline that phrase? 
the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Father, I pray that you'd bless this crowd. And Lord, may the breath of heaven blow across us. And Lord, may we understand some things from the passage of Scripture that we've read and from other passages that we will read. Lord, that will help us to be servants who will be steadfast and able to keep on serving you no matter what happens and even have joy in the midst of trials. I pray that you'd bless to that end now in Jesus' name. Amen. So maybe you've heard the old story uh, about the bricklayer. He finished a job, Brother Jimmy, on, <laughs> he got up to the third floor, and when he got done laying the brick, he had a number of brick left over there on top of the building that he needed to get back down to the ground. And so uh, he got to thinking how he'd do this, how he could retrieve those brick, and so he went up to the third floor and uh, extended an arm out over the top of the building and put a pulley on the end of it and, and a rope all the way down to the ground and he tied a, a big barrel, a big steel drum on top of the, or up to the rope and, and he pulled the barrel all the way up to the top to the third floor and then tied the rope at the bottom on the ground and then he went up to the third floor and took all those brick and put into the barrel. And uh, he got the barrel full and, and so then he went back down to the bottom floor to the ground uh, to untie the barrel and let the brick down. But as he untied the barrel, he realized that a barrel of bricks weighs more than a man. And as he untied that barrel of bricks, suddenly that barrel of bricks on top began to descend at a high rate of speed. He forgot to turn loose of the rope and he began, began to ascend at a high rate of speed. And he forgot to turn loose of the rope. He got halfway up and met the barrel of bricks. And the barrel of bricks hit him in the shoulder, causing a severe wound. And uh, then he got to the top. <laughs> and as he got to the top, the pulley rolled his fingers up in the pulley and pinched his fingers between the rope and the pulley. And about that time, at the same time, the brick barrel of brick hit the ground. Now when they did, the bottom fell out of the barrel, and so did all the brick. Now the brick is out of the barrel, and the barrel is much lighter than a man. And suddenly, the barrel begins to go up at a high rate of speed. And the man hanging on to the rope at the top, the bricklayer started to come down at a high rate of speed. He met the barrel again about halfway, this time hitting him in the shins and causing another severe wound. Well. <laughs> As he, as he made his rapid, rapid descent, he landed on top of that pile of sharp brick at the bottom and got all banged up, causing a third severe wound. And so he applied to have a few days off work after that. Now, sometimes we might feel like that bricklayer. We might feel like we're going up and down and getting wounded in the process and we're getting hit from every side and we didn't really realize why it was all happening. Now, in the case of this bricklayer, his, prob his problem was pretty easily discerned. Uh, he wasn't very good at physics, for one thing. And in the second place, he wasn't very bright. And so he created his own problem. But let me ask you a question. Have you ever had things to happen to you when you were doing everything right? You didn't create your own problem. You were just minding your own business. You were trying to serve the Lord. You were trying to be faithful to God. You were trying to do everything right. And still, you end up on a roller coaster ride and you get wounded. You get hurt. Well, we've got when something like that happens to, the, to us, like this bricklayer, we, or in your real life, we have a bunch of cliches like, well, when you come to the end of your rope, you just tie a knot and hang on. Does that help a lot? <laughs> or somebody says, uh, you know, <laughs> just grin and bear it. Yeah, well, that helps a lot too, doesn't it? <laughs> Not really. Or maybe somebody says, uh, cheer up. 
it could be worse, and sure enough, it gets worse. Well, things can happen like that, and it happens to you and me, and sometimes, here's the, here's the, here's the, the horror of the story. Sometimes those things happen when we're doing everything right. We examine our lives, and, and we say, man, I, I think I was doing everything I possibly could do to make things turn out right, and everything turned into a mess. Well, in this story that we've read about Joseph, if you read the whole story, you find out that Joseph is a young man. He's about 17 years old, and uh, his brothers sell him into slavery up in the land of, uh, they're up in, the, in the, the promised land, in Canaan land, and they sell all of his brothers. They get this wicked plan, and they sell him to a caravan that's going down into Egypt, and when he gets down there, he is bought as a slave by uh, the keeper of the prison by the name of Potiphar. And so Potiphar puts him to work as a slave, and, and it's not long before you see in the story, in fact, in verse number 21, it says, but the Lord was with Joseph. And uh, everything that Joseph did, even when he was in Potiphar's house, everything that Joseph did, uh, God was with him. And you don't see anything negative about Joseph in here. It's not like he was doing some bad things and God was just punishing him for it. He was doing things right. Now, I want to give you some principles tonight. And I'm, I'm going to give you a title for the message. The title of the message. Embracing the presence of God when nothing seems to make sense. Embracing the presence of God when nothing seems to make sense. Now notice, I didn't say in the title, when nothing makes sense. What was the words? When nothing seems to make sense. Now, the story that we told about the bricklayer is kind of funny, but when it happens to us in real life, it's not very funny. But Joseph went to work as a slave. And as Joseph served... As Joseph served Potiphar, Potiphar recognized right away that there's something different about this young man. Are you with me? It's kind of warm in here. I know the, the, the baptistry heater's been on and, and the air conditioner had been put on hold. Uh, I had pushed the button on there, I guess, earlier today and didn't realize it. And the temperature had, uh, had been raised up to 74. And we usually have it down to about 68 in here. And there's a lot of humidity in the air. You can see the condensation on the windows. So it's a, it's a little bit muggy. Uh, but don't go to sleep. I'll, I'll run up and down the aisle every once in a while just to make sure you, your eyes are moving so you stay awake. Uh, but Potiphar, don't you yawn. <laughs> the, the, the man Potiphar, the prisoner of the guard, he sees that something's different about Joseph. Joseph is a young man who has a work ethic. He's an industrious young man. He's a, he's a worker. He's got some things going for him. He's, he's a very alert young man. He's sharp. And so Potiphar puts him to work in his home and, and, and this young man is doing everything. Potiphar keeps promoting him and he's doing everything. And so Joseph is, is keeping the books and he's directing the other servants of the household and, and he's just the leader. He's doing a good job. And, uh, and then one day, Potiphar's wife, Mrs. Potiphar, begins to cast her eye upon Joseph. Joseph's a young man. He's muscular. He's handsome. He's, uh, he, he's an exciting young man. And so she begins to, to tempt him and test him and, and to lure him. And so one day he comes in the house. He's taking care of his master's business. And she casts her eye upon him once more and tries to tempt him. In fact, she grabs him by the coat and tries to pull him into the bed with her. And he immediately says, no, I can't, I can't do this great evil. I can't sin against God this way. And so he wants to get away. This man's got character. Hello? This fellow has character. I mean, he didn't have the philosophy when in Egypt do as the Egyptians do. And so... Instead of giving in to the temptation, the lust, he just ran and left his coat hanging in her hand. And she was humiliated. And, well, in fact, I think it was Victor Hugo, uh, I believe, that said, Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. And this woman was mad. She's been embarrassed. She's been scorned. And so she probably ruffles up her hair a little, maybe tears her clothes a little bit, and then she calls for the other servants and tells them that, that uh, Joseph, this Hebrew slave, has tried to molest her. When her husband comes home, she tells him that same story. He's angry and thrusts Joseph 
into prison. Now, wait a minute. What was Joseph doing wrong? He was trying to live for God. He was trying to keep his morals straight. He tried to do the right thing and ended up in prison. He's totally innocent, but I want you to look at this story, and I want to give you five principles on what to do, how to practice or embrace the presence of God when everything seems to be going wrong and when everything, nothing, seems to make any sense. Well, when you're in a situation like this and it doesn't seem to make sense, you know what would be easy for, for Joseph to do? He's been cast into prison now unjustly. It would be easy for Joseph to listen to the devil whisper in his ear and say, ha, looks like serving God got you a long ways, buddy. Looks like serving God really paid off for you. What's your God gonna do for you now? You're in jail and you didn't do anything wrong. Ha, some God you've got. <laughs> and he begins to scorn and make fun. And uh, that brings us to our first point. When things like this happen, when you're innocent, you've done everything right, and everything seems to go wrong, number one, don't demand to understand. Don't demand that God help you to understand everything. Now, it's not unnatural to wonder why. And it's not, I don't think it's a sin to ask why. But it may be that God doesn't give you an answer. It may be that you're in prison like Joseph and God just doesn't tell you why. And it may be a while before you find out if you ever do. But God is still God and God is always good. And so the best thing to do is not demand an answer of why this happened. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, the Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Did you hear that? Trust in the Lord with how much? All your heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding. In other words, we don't have to try to figure things out. Bad things happen to good people. You know what? That doesn't surprise me. You know what surprises me? That anything good happens to bad people. <laughs> That's what surprises me. Because we're all, the Bible says, none of us, there's none that doeth good, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The, the absolute truth is that all of us deserve to go to hell because we've all sinned and, and we have shook our fist in the face of God and we've sinned. It's only by His grace that we're saved. It's by His mercy that He decided to save us. And so, now I want to, I want to take you to another passage of scripture. Turn to Isaiah chapter 50 and verse number 10. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse number 10. And while you're turning there, I'll finish the rest of that verse. The Bible said there in, in uh, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. What do we learn from that? Well, if I don't understand what's going on, I don't know why God has let this happen to me. Here I am in prison, I'm Joseph and I'm in prison and I don't know why. Well, if you can't understand it, let God lead you, follow his footsteps. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall what? Direct your paths, thy paths. And so just remember if you don't understand, you keep following God anyway. Now in Isaiah chapter 50, watch this, this is an interesting passage of scripture. Who is among you that feareth the Lord? that obeyeth, did you see that word? Obeyeth the voice of his servant that walketh in darkness and hath no light. Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. Behold all ye that kindle a fire that compass yourselves about with sparks, walk in the light of the fire and the sparks that ye have kindled, this shall ye have of mine hand, ye shall lie down in sorrow. What does that verse teach? What do those verses teach? That means simply this, that you, you can be a child of God, you can be walking in the light and suddenly find yourself in darkness. He says it's the hand of the Lord. And times of perplexity can come. Have you always got life figured out? Do things sometimes look a little perplexing to you? Huh? I'm nodding my head. Yeah. Things sometimes look a little perplexing, and I, 
I wonder why God didn't do it a different way. I wonder what does the Bible say about God. The Bible says his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so it's a good thing we've got a God that's smarter than we are. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of things in your life you're not going to figure out. Job, one of the greatest characters in the Old Testament, ended up in this situation. A lot of things were happening to Job. He suffered greatly. And you know what Job did? Job demanded answers from God. Job said, look, God, I want, I've, I've been living right. I've been doing right. I've been giving sacrifices. I've been watching out, trying to make my kids do right. And now this has happened. I want to know why. And the rest of the book of Job, just about all is devoted to that. And, and he has these friends who are trying to tell him why. And they're as lost and as, and, and as in dark as he is. <laughs> and then at the end, finally, God makes him to see, if I decide that I need you to walk in darkness for a while, just walk in darkness. I'll let you know if I, know, if I want you to know what's going on. <laughs> you say, well, it sounds like God is smart aleck and sarcastic. No, God just knows more than we do, and he knows what's best, and he knows what he's doing. You can read about the prophet Habakkuk. He was a great prophet, and he couldn't understand why history was going the way it was. Habakkuk couldn't understand why all the suffering was going on around him. You know, like some of the people ask today, well, if there's a God, why is there suffering? Why is there people starving on other continents? And why all the wars? And why all the horrible things? And what about that man that kidnapped that, that young girl and murdered her brother and, uh, and mother? And what about, why, if there's a God, why do those things happen? Well, Habakkuk was wondering the same thing, and he was demanding answers of God. And God's not our puppet that we can just say, God, you've got to explain this. No, he doesn't have to. Think about John the Baptist. John the Baptist, the one who that day saw Jesus walking, and John the Baptist looked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. John the Baptist recognized Jesus for who he was, the Savior of the world. And friend, there is no other way to be saved other than Jesus Christ. If you're watching by way of internet tonight, I want you to know that Jesus loves you, and he is the way. John chapter 14, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus said, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John the Baptist recognized that. And yet, at the end of John's life, John the Baptist ended up, guess where? In prison. And you know what John did? Now the Bible, Jesus himself said about John the Baptist, he said, there has not been a greater man born among women than John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, when he got in prison, said, sent some of his disciples, said, go find out about Jesus. I'm not even sure he's the Messiah anymore. You know what? You can end up walking in darkness and perplexity because things happen. I mean, John the Baptist didn't have a clue that he's going to. He's introduced the Savior of the world, and now he's in prison awaiting execution. I guess maybe I might be guilty of doubting a little bit there. And if I was in John's place, I might say, are we following the right one? <laughs> I thought he was coming to set up a kingdom. Not let me get my head cut off. Well, Job, Habakkuk, John the Baptist, Paul, <laughs> and you and you and me, <laughs> we're going to come into some darkness from time to time. And in Isaiah chapter 50 it says, Who is my servant that follows me and obeys me and walks in darkness and hath no light? <laughs> well, it's me. It's you from time to time. It happens. The darkness can never put out the light. The light is just withdrawn for a little while. Joseph didn't understand what God was up to. Now I want to read that verse out of Isaiah 55. I alluded to it a little while ago. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Well, how far is up? How high is high? God's, God's thoughts are much higher. If you can measure Mount Everest, <laughs> then God's thoughts are higher than that. If you can measure the distance to the North Star, God's thoughts are higher than that. I can't think that far out, but God can. And so, in all thy ways, acknowledge him. Don't demand 
that God show you an answer. You can ask him, and if he doesn't show you, be content to say he didn't decide to show me. Why? Now, number two, don't fail to be faithful. We're talking about how to respond, how to practice the presence, how to embrace the presence of God. What did our scripture say? The Bible says, remember, we read that together, but the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with him. Now, that's the key. Why was the Lord with him? Well, second thing, don't fail to be faithful. When things go wrong, look at verses 21 and following in, chap in this chapter here. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him. That is, with Joseph. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. <laughs> now, it doesn't seem like a good thing to get cast into prison, does it? But if God's with you, it'll be okay. And what are we talking about? Remaining faithful. What did Joseph do? He got through and thrown in prison. So what did he do? He sat down in the corner and said, I give up, I quit. No, he didn't do that, did he? What did Joseph do? He didn't sit down. He didn't quit. He got up and said, you know, if I'm going to be in here, I might as well be doing something. Where's a broom? <laughs> so he sweeps the floor and he gets something going. He said, look, guys, we're going to be in here. There's no use sitting in this filth. Let's clean this place up. Come on, boys, let's sing a little while we work and play. And, and so they cleaned the place up. Joseph was a leader. He was the kind of guy that got things done. He was an industrious man. And so the prison guard put everything in his hand. He was the leader of the prison. Sure, he's locked up, but he keeps on serving. He keeps on serving. He keeps on serving. Now, you know what happens to a lot of Christians? They're doing everything right. They're being faithful. And then the bottom falls out. And they say, look, I didn't do anything wrong. I was trying to serve the Lord, and then this happens. They were doing fine until a husband left them. They were doing fine until a, a wife died. A Christian was just doing great. Maybe a, maybe a grandchild died. Everything was going good, and then suddenly their business went bankrupt. Everything was going okay, and then things fell apart at their church. You know, how, you know how many people I talk to since I've been saved, since I've been preaching? I have talked to I don't know how many hundreds that I ask to come to church and they say, Preacher, I'm not going to go into it, but I just had a bad experience at church one time. And I was, I was serving the Lord. I was singing in the choir. I was teaching Sunday school, and I was doing everything right. And then some people just mistreated me, and I'm not going back. Is that the pattern we see out of Joseph? Hardly. Joseph said, Aw, shucks, might as well be doing something. No, you're sitting here rotting in this thing. I'll just go ahead and work. And he got busy. Even when it doesn't seem to make sense, listen to me, when it doesn't seem to make sense, keep on serving God. Keep on. Number three, don't bow to bitterness. It's easy to get bitter when these things happen. Now turn to chapter 40 and look in verse 14 and 15. Joseph is in prison. He's talking to the butler now. <clears throat> the butler's been cast into prison. He's going to be released from prison. And Joseph knows that because he's the butler, he's going to serve in the presence of Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt. And, uh, and he thinks perhaps the butler can speak to Pharaoh on his behalf, on Joseph's behalf, maybe get him out of prison. And so that's where we pick up here in, in uh, verse number 14. But, but think on me when it shall be well with thee. In other words, when, you're out of, when you get out of prison, think on me. And show kindness, I pray thee, unto me. And make mention of me unto Pharaoh. And bring me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews. And here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. So he's saying, now first of all, I was sold down here as a slave. 
I was serving in the house of Potiphar. I got put into prison unjustly. So when you get back into the palace, you talk to Pharaoh for me. You'll be his butler, and you talk to Pharaoh and see if he can bring me out. But <laughs> guess what? He's not bitter about it. As I read this, you know what? I don't, I don't see, I don't see, I don't see Joseph saying, you know, those lousy brothers of mine that sold me into slavery, they ought to have their heads snapped off. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. He didn't say, that stupid Potiphar, that guy that's so blind and dumb and listens to his wife about everything. <laughs> he didn't say that. He didn't say Potiphar's wife, you know, that that sleazy heifer. <laughs> you don't hear him saying any of that stuff. <laughs> He's not bitter. Has he been mistreated? You bet he has. Does he, if anybody had a reason to get to be hurt and bitter and to curse everybody around him, Joseph would have had that reason, but he didn't do that. He didn't curse the prison. He didn't curse the darkness. He was content to leave everything with God. Are you listening to me? Bad things happen to good people. But when you get bitter, are you listening? When you get bitter, you've sealed your own doom. When you get bitter, hey, when things go wrong and you're serving God, when that kind of a test comes, you're serving God, you're doing right, and the test comes, that will test your character. More than, than if you get caught doing something wrong, you, know, you hear what I'm saying? Hey, if we get caught doing something wrong, we deserve to get caught. We deserve what happens to us. That's no test. Listen to this in 1 Peter 2.20. For what glory is it if when you are buffeted for your faults that you take, a, take it patiently, but if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. <laughs> What's he saying? He's saying that when you do something wrong and suffer for it, you know, that's no proof of anything. But when you're doing well, you're trying to live for God, you're doing things right, and then you suffer for it, and you suffer patiently. You're long-suffering. You're content to leave it with God. Now that's a test. You pass that test, you've done good. That's what he's talking about. Bitter people are not very nice to be around. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? Bitter people are not very nice to be around. People that get bitter complain and criticize and gossip, spread stories. Who likes to hear that? Not me. <laughs> Bitterness. I've heard of preachers who get bitter because they've gone through some kind of experience. They've done everything they could to lead a church and they were doing well. And then church just kicks them out. I've known some preachers like that. They were doing a good job. And the church just booted them out. They, they wanted a preacher who was poor and humble. And so they told the Lord to keep him humble and they'd keep him poor. <laughs> and they stole his... I know a church... I was. Uh, I know a church very well. I know the people who was in the church that decided they wanted to get rid of the pastor once and uh, they didn't want to get rid of him and, and uh, they kept cutting his salary and cutting his salary and so they just all quit tithing, quit giving to the church and they starved him out. <laughs> That's pretty sorry, isn't it? He was pretty bitter about it. And friend, when you get bitter, especially when you were doing good, you know you were doing right and then you get bitter, you cut your own throat. Number four, don't be unwilling to wait. God, if you're in prison, Joseph, listen, Joseph, God will get you out in his time. God will bring you out, Joseph, when it's time. Genesis 40, 23. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. Well, what a blessing. <laughs> I mean, here's Joseph helps the butler get out of prison, but the butler, as soon as he's out, man, he's looking out for number one. <laughs> he doesn't give a rip for Joseph still rotting there in the dungeon. 
and so he forgets him. Finally, he's remembered. Now, but here's the key. Here's, what, here's the point I want to make. When Joseph gets sold into slavery and he goes down into Potiphar's house, how old is he? 17. Watch this. Genesis 41, 46. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. 30 years old. He's been in prison all this time. A 17-year-old boy who's trying to live for God. The age of these guys here. You guys are 18 though, aren't you already? And so he's, he's the, roughly the age of these guys here. Is anybody here 17 besides me? You're 17? Joseph was the age that you are. He went into prison as a youngster. And now he's 30 years old when Pharaoh brings him out to stand before him. Now, that's a, pretty good, that's a pretty good amount of time to spend in prison, isn't it? I mean, especially if you're not guilty of anything. And all of this time, he's been busy working in the prison. He hasn't become bitter. He hasn't become a criticizer. He's, done, he's kept on serving God all those years. And guess what? God brings him out. A 17-year-old boy, year after year, spent in prison. Many of those years were spent in prison. What's the point? Wait. Wait on God. Everybody gets in a hurry today. I said this morning, I was talking about young ladies getting in such a hurry. Got to have a husband. Got to have a man right now. Got to have a man. I'm 17 years old and not married yet. I, if I reach 20, I'll have to commit suicide. Because I don't have a man. <laughs> when, Girls think they've got, to, they've, got to be, they've got to be bearing children before 20 or they're past the age. You know? A lot of mistakes are made because people, listen to me, people get in a hurry about everything. People get in a hurry. Don't wait. I was praying with somebody about a job and, and I said, look, there, there is a job. I know God's got a job for you. God's got an honorable job for you. Just don't get in a hurry and take something that God didn't mean for you to have. That person immediately ran and got a job doing something that they shouldn't have been doing. And the very next week, the bank called and wanted to set up a, a meeting to hire this person. And they could have had an honorable job but decided to do it the other way. Why? Not willing to wait. We can't wait on God. We've got to take things into our own hands. We've got to do it now. <laughs> Psalm 37, verse 5 through 9. Listen to it. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And when he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way. Uh, stop right there just for a moment. Everybody's making more money than I am, so I'm going to go do something else. Even if it's not in God's will, I'll go do something else because I've got to make more money. <laughs> well, he says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him, and fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger, forsake wrath, fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, for evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, did you hear that? Those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Oh, would to God we could learn to wait. Ladies and gentlemen, we just get in such a big hurry, and we think of if everything doesn't pan out within a day or two of what we prayed for, somehow we've got to change directions. We've got to grab hold of the, we've got to grab hold of the helm and start to steer this ship ourselves because God's just not doing it. You know what it is? It's a test. God wants to see if you meant business when you said, we're going to do the right thing. We're going to serve God. Well, let's see if you do. It ought to, we ought to be able to stick with it for more than a day or a week, don't you think? Over and over again in the Bible we're told to wait upon the Lord. God has a schedule and we need to be willing to wait on it. Number five, and this is it. This is the last principle I'll give you. Here's the last principle. Don't let dreams dissolve. Joseph had a dream. That dream was put in his bosom when he was a teenager. 
He had a dream. He saw this dream as described in a, a few earlier chapters than what we've read right here. And Joseph has a dream. He dreams that, that all of the world's rulers are going to somehow come to him for sustenance. All of the world's resources would be laid at his feet. Now that was a dream that God gave him. And he didn't give up on that dream. You say, but man, all those years in prison, you think he really thought that dream would still come to pass? I do. I don't see Joseph complaining. I think he's sitting there in prison, sitting there doing his job, thinking, well, I don't know when God's going to do it, but God gave me the dream. I'm hanging on to it. Don't give up. Don't distinguish the dream. Now, we're going to skip a lot of material here for time's sake, but we're going to go down to uh, chapter 41 and verse number 37. Joseph is exalted now. He's out of prison. He has miraculously become the prime minister of Egypt. Hey, he was in prison just a little while ago. He was in a dirty rat infested dungeon sweeping the floors. And now suddenly he finds himself prime minister right under Pharaoh. Look at this. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and the eyes of his, all of his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such an one as this? Uh, this is a man in whom the Spirit of God is. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, listen to this, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over. He's speaking to Joseph. Pharaoh is saying this to Joseph. He said, Thou shalt be over my house. According unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took his ring from off his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck and made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried before him, Bow the knee, bow the knee. And he made him ruler over the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto, unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Now this was the dream. Listen, this is the dream that Joseph had when he was a teenager, that he was going to occupy a, a place like this, the ruler of the world. Egypt was the ruling the world at this time. And now Pharaoh has made him to ride in the second chariot. That would be like riding in the, in the, in the car right behind the President of the United States, being second in command and over all that. In fact, it's, it was a much more powerful position than our vice president. I don't even know who the guy is. And, uh, nobody else does either. And, and even though he doesn't know who he is. But, but I'm saying this position was actually, he was running Egypt. Pharaoh wasn't running the land. He was just greater in the th throne. He was like the figurehead. But Joseph was running the business of the whole country. He was the prime minister. Now, he's riding in the second chariot. Get this picture. Let's try to picture this. Joseph is in the second chariot. There's a parade going right through the middle of town. And he's in the second chariot. And uh, Pharaoh has the, the heralds to announce before Pharaoh and before Joseph, bow the knee. And all these people are bowing to Joseph, the fellow that was in prison earlier. Now, here's, I pictured this. See if you can picture this with me. Can you just see Potiphar standing out <laughs> on the curb of the street and Joseph's, remember Potiphar? He was the one who had Joseph put into prison. Potiphar standing on the sidewalk and along comes Joseph in that chariot and the heralds say, bow the knee there, sir. And Potiphar drops down to his knees as Joseph drives by. And maybe at supper that night, listen, at supper, Potiphar goes home. And he and his wife, his lovely wife, are sitting at supper and they're eating. And Potiphar says, uh, wife, you remember that slave, that Hebrew slave we had a few years ago? She said, yeah, yeah, I remember him. You remember that, what you accused him of? Well, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Potiphar says, boy, I hope you're right. I've got to report to work to him tomorrow. Can you imagine? He never let his dream die. 
dark comes. But I like this saying. Somebody said, don't doubt in the dark what God has shown you in the light. Don't doubt in the dark what God has showed you in the light. The pressure gets on and we begin to doubt the decisions we've made. We said, Lord, I'm going to serve you with the rest of my life. I'll do whatever. I don't have to have a big mansion. I don't have to have a brand new car. I don't have to have a large income. I don't have to have the best job in the world. I don't have to have anything fancy. Lord, as long as I can serve you, I can be faithful in church and I can live for you and I can have a godly family, that's all that I want, Lord. We make those decisions. How long will they last? Don't undo in doubt what you did in faith. Don't doubt in the darkness what God showed you in the light. Would you bow with me please in prayer?